The Ontario Diagnostic Days on realagriculture.com is brought to you by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, the University of Guelph, Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, Grain Farmers of Ontario, Agris Co-op, BSF Canada, Bear and DeKalb, Corteva and Pioneer, Great Lakes Grain, Mazex, The Mosaic Company, Pride Seeds, and Syngenta. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to Ontario Diagnostic Days, episode number five. Today we're gonna to focus on soil health, nutrient management, and more. We'll start the show with cover crops as University of Guelph researcher Laura Van Erd and OMAFRA's Ann Verhallen tour Van Erd's long-term research trials. They'll explore what the research is telling us, including cover crops impact on yield, organic matter, and soil resiliency. From there, we'll take you into a soil pit with OMAFRA's Jim Warren and Alex Barry as they highlight the impacts of compaction throughout the soil profile. Next up are OMAFRA's Horse Bonner and Aaron Stefanis from the Mosaic Company. They'll dig into soybean nutrient deficiencies and share strategies on how to better feed soybeans. OMAFRA's forage specialist Christine O'Reilly returns to the program. She's been working on the windrow moisture sampler she profiled on day two. She's made some modifications that you'll want to check out. We'll wrap up the day with Jim Warren and Dan Surrett from OMAFRA. They'll give us a snapshot of the Ontario Topsoil Sampling Project and a sneak peek at some of the insights they'll share at the Ontario Ag Conference in January. Again, CEU credits are available for Ontario Diagnostic Days. Look for the URL where you can apply for your credits. You'll see that on the screen throughout the episode. We also want to give you an opportunity to engage with our experts. We've provided their contact information at the end of the episode. And we also encourage you to put your comments and your questions in our YouTube comments section as you're watching the episode. We'll get you some answers. Here's episode number five. Today we're at the Ridgetown campus, University of Guelph, looking at long-term cover crop plots behind us here. I'm Ann Verhollen, Soil Management Specialist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. And of course, I'm joined by Dr. Laura Veneard, Professor of Sustainable Soil Management. I still struggle right with that. I shouldn't because it's an amazing piece to be working on. Anyways, what we're talking about today is cover crops and the benefits of cover crops. Laura's got some of the longest uh, term project with cover crops that we've got in Ontario. And we've seen a lot of claims around cover crops and the benefits of cover crops in recent years. So I got a few hard questions to ask Laura today. The first one I want to start with is around organic matter. Lots of claims around cover crops and building organic matter, but does that really work in Ontario? Yes, definitely it works in Ontario and we're seeing it here at Richtown campus in my long-term cover crop trials. Uh, so this is nice sandy loam soil, 3.4% organic matter when we have no cover crop. With the long-term cover cropping, that's bumped up to 3.9%. So 3.4 to 3.9. That's a 5% uh, difference in organic matter or a 15% increase. So we are seeing increases in organic matter. That's my trial. If we look at Allura with the use of red clover with, in small grains, we see increases in organic matter. Um, it's there in our long-term data. I know your follow-up question is, but how, right? How does it accumulate? And uh, it's a twofold. One is protection. So cover crops protect the soil from wind and water erosion. Uh, and then they're capturing sunlight. They are converting carbon dioxide to plant material, right? Photosynthesis, that's all carbon-based. And what we see above ground is also happening below ground. 
also protecting the soil and carbon inputs. That's the main way we see over the long term increases in organic matter. Okay, so that's Ontario between Alora and Ridgetown. There was some measurements done by the Soil Health Institute here too. What, what were their findings? Same, right? Increases. So those numbers that I, I used, 3.4 with no cover cropping, uh, 3.9 with long-term cover cropping, that's from the Soil Health Institute. That's their numbers. And we saw those numbers after eight years uh, in an independent study, increase in organic matter. So we've got two independent um, institutions, University of Guelph and the Soil Health Institute who have measured carbon and saw that increase. Um, and that's on, in Ontario. The trends are the same throughout North America. Um, organic matter increases from 10 to 42 percent with long-term cover cropping. So in those experiments they had to be 10 years of cover cropping. Okay, so let's talk, dive into this a little bit further. We've had a lot of speakers come in over the years talking about cover crops and talking about, you know, increases in yields and being able to reduce their fertilizer use and building resiliency. Do your plots support that? Yes, yeah, we're seeing the same thing, but only now, right? In the long term, we're seeing a build in resiliency. Um, so in 2000, it was a dry year. We were dry up until mid-July and the corn, we could see it in the corn. So without cover crops, without good organic matter, that corn looked deficient. It was shorter, it was less green, you know, typical uh, symptoms of nitrogen deficiency. And we know nitrogen and water go together. Where we had good organic matter, where we had long-term cover cropping, that's where we get cycling of nitrogen. And it was, it was providing it to, to the crop. So where I said uh, 59 bushel yield increase, that was due to the nitrogen. That's resilience in my mind. It's where uh, a resilient field ignores your mistakes and forgets about the weather. Okay, so that was 2020 that you got that 59 bushel increase. What about 2021? Because we started out pretty dry here. Then we got wet. Oh, of course, really this is Ridgetown. Wet. Really wet. And then we've gone back and forth between some dry periods and, and some wet periods again, right, right up until now. So in 2021, we're seeing the same thing with cover crops over the long term. We're seeing greener, taller, better crop compared to, and you can see it in the background here, less green, nitrogen deficient, without cover crops in the system for the long term, lower organic matter. So yeah, we are seeing that now in our long-term cover crop trials. Okay, so we're building organic matter, we're building resiliency with, with using cover crops, but how long does it take? How patient do I need to be? Yeah, you need to be patient. It's not one and done. It requires a commitment. So in our plots, we saw it after eight years, you know, 10 to 13, 13 years before you see the crop responding to that organic matter in those dry years, those stressful years. So it takes time. Now, all other thing to consider is that I'm in a vegetable system, processing veg. So we can get cover crops planted in, in August, right? So we've got August, September, October to grow cover crops, to accumulate biomass, to sequester carbon. It really does take time. So 12 years, that's, that's about what we're seeing here. What does the research show? Well, in the research, it's, it's 10 years, right? Of, of having cover crops in your system. When, when you're less than that, in that short to medium term, about uh, increasing organic matter, that's about a 50-50% chance that you can do it in the short term. Uh, that's based on research from North America, from short term, medium term to long term experiments. And keep in mind, this soil type here is a sandy loam too. So 
Results may vary. <laughs> yes, uh, but we are seeing more and more consistent increases in organic matter. More data from long-term trials is showing the value of cover crops in your system. Okay, some really great work, Laura, on, on cover crops, and I'm thrilled that we've got cover crop plots in Ontario that are this old, that they're actually starting to show these kinds of results and backing up what a lot of the long-term cover croppers will tell you. But what is the bottom line for growers who are thinking about cover crops? Yeah, the bottom line is it takes time. It takes patience and commitment. It's not one and done. You need to plan your, your cover crop, uh, not just say, okay, I'm going to plant a cover crop. What are you going to seed? How are you going to seed it? How are you going to terminate it? What's your How goal? There you go. What's your goal? And so I think the goal is building organic matter, building resiliency so that in 12 years, when we don't know what the weather might be, you have protection against that variable weather, protection against stress. And that's what resiliency is, right? It, a resilient field ignores your mistakes and uh, ignores the weather. Soil, black gold. When you realize that less than 3% of the Earth's surface is actually suitable for growing crops, it emphasizes the point that this soil is one of our most valuable resources. Valuable obviously to the farmer who's growing food, but frankly even to all of society. And when you think about the fact that this soil probably took hundreds of years to form, but yet it can be destroyed in a matter of seconds because of the risks to it. So what am I talking about here? Well, one of those risks is soil compaction. And we're gonna spend a couple of sessions here talking about soil compaction, why it's a problem, and what are some of the things we can do about it. Today I'm at the site of Mapleview Farms, Listowel, Ontario, where we've just held the North American Manure Expo 2021. And we've had all kinds of large equipment moving around site, doing demonstrations, applying manure, agitating manure, uh, both liquid and solid, and we also have a compaction demo that we're going to show you uh, in a few minutes. But I, I think it's important that we understand right up front one of the key things about soil. Any healthy soil is going to be about 50% pore space. Let me show you what I mean. If I take this sponge, just an everyday household sponge, and you look at that sponge, you can see very clearly it's full of pore spaces. I can squeeze it and it will go back to its shape. And that's much like a good soil should be. So let me take that sponge and I'll put it in this water here. And let's squeeze out what we get. That's how much water that sponge or that healthy soil could hold. Now I have a second sponge in here the difference being, and this one's been soaking for a while in here, this one though has been compacted. Much like a soil that's been driven over, either wrong time of year, wrong soil conditions, wrong tires, whatever the case may be. But let me squeeze out the water in it. There's a big difference between those two. And that's just a simple demonstration to show you the impacts of soil compaction. All right, so down here in the soil pit, uh, joined by my colleague, Jim Warren. Uh, he's gonna kind of tell us the, the geological history of the land that we're, we're playing around on today. Um, as far as finding compacted areas in your field, uh, this is my go-to. Um, you can build these at home, there's nothing magic, piece of steel. Uh, weld a little tip on the end and then just walk around your field and lean on it. Obviously I'm well down into the into the soil profile here. Just lean on it. You don't have to try to bend it or anything and just get a feel, sort of get that steering wheel feedback um, of your 
of your field in a different a few different spots so i like to go probably over to the fence bottom uh, maybe under those trees and see kind of what the undisturbed uh, natural compaction situation is and then come out into some areas that you know you might be questioning so wheel tracks good place to check mid middle of you know the undriven areas of the field see what's going on there and i can put this tile probe into the ground uh, fairly decently far all over i tried it in a wheel track i tried it in between um, other than the general stoniness i'd say in these conditions probably pretty uh, pretty okay um, no what i'm looking for is real drastic changes in in sort of you know force required so that's going to tell me i've kind of got a layer probably of of some denser soil um, but what i was finding jim i could bury this about that far into the ground and and that lines up pretty well with a, a horizon that you've established here so so what do you think's going on there well <clears throat> uh could be any number of things actually it, this is a more or less a clay based clay loam based soil so fairly fine textured uh and you'd expect a, a little bit of water impedance and possibly you know, the stuff is, is fairly easy to compact just because it's a clay uh, what you're probably running into there is the sea horizon at the bottom, which is the, the native parent material of, of the soil here. Um, I guess that's that's kind of natural because as as you go down, your bulk density will will increase. Um, but you got to watch out for, I would think. Again, not being a compaction expert, but the clay here is the, the one where you, you got to watch that could you get subsurface compaction uh, just because that clay is there. Yeah, and that ties into sort of the axle weight story that I was talking about earlier. So um, most light pieces of equipment, I say light, like lighter axle weights, but higher pressure tires, maybe poorer selected tires, you're really going to see the effect, you know, in this topsoil layer. And this is what you're immediately going to see in your crop. Um, you're going to see, you know, wheel track damage or, or emergence issues uh, where you've driven inside of the year in that crop condition. Uh, but the long-term effects from that deep compaction, um, those are harder to spot and harder to diagnose. Um, but over in the in the soil pits where I had the sensors installed, um, I was at a sensor at 6, 12, and 20 inches, so roughly at these depths, if you want to picture that, um, and measuring the sort of the confinement pressure, the squeezing force that that, that vehicle is putting on the soil as it um, traverses. Um, so if you can imagine, you know, what's the force being squeezed onto this golf tee, that's what I'm measuring. Um, we were getting, you know, high pressures here, reasonably high pressures here. It's going to be lower as that, that pressure zone distributes into the soil. And then we hit this kind of this massive block of clay, Jim. Mm -hmm. um, and my sensor would just be, just be inside of that clay region. Um, and we weren't hardly picking up any stress at all. Uh, with the heavier pieces of equipment, heavier axle loads, we were just starting to see that pressure bulb just kind of reach down to that layer about one and two or three PSI. And that really tells me um, in this soil, this is a really good structure right now and it's the, the conditions are appropriate, uh, I would say. Uh, not too much water. We did have a, a dry area and a wetter area. We had put some, some simulated rainfall on, on the area where we had the sensors installed. And you can see pretty significant difference in the amount of stress, uh, lower stress levels in the in the drier pit than in the higher, uh, the wetter pit. And that's due to this, what I'm thinking is this top layer, um, there's a significant amount of organic matter in it. Yeah, there is. I expect actually it's going to be actually a little higher in the top. Uh, the producers here, uh, the soil hasn't seen a plow, a whole board plow in 25 years. Oh, meters. really? Yeah. So you can see it marked at AP1, AP2. So this is their cultivated layer right now. Oh yeah, I can see that little bit of a shelf curved out here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, this area below probably hasn't seen sunlight in 25 years. Oh really? Yeah. So, so, so the original plow layer would have been down to here when they were plowing moldboard. And now with their light tillage or whatever their whatever management system they're using, they're only really touching the surface and that's it. That's interesting. So um, the rule of thumb for soils, a uh, 1% organic matter for every four, 5% clay content, that's going to give you a really resilient uh, or a strong soil uh, for load bearing. So um, I think Jim came up with a number around three and a half, four percent, four percent, something like that. We're somewhere in the clay loam region, yep. you say. Yep. Um, yeah. So we're, we're flirting with the ballpark there. Um, 
and and we're in that region and that that really agrees with what i've been seeing over at the the soil sensors um not too high stresses um from what we've seen on other soil types and other other wetness conditions um so overall here a, a pretty strong soil uh, able to handle a lot of these weights that we're throwing at it uh, one thing that's also interesting is this this sort of mixed layer of would you call that kind of a, a sand well it's, there it, it, looks it, like there's some sand in it it, but. Has, it has there's a little more sand in it it's it's actually an interesting interesting area i've got it labeled here as a btgj there's actually two of them if you want to see it one here the surface of a one and a two you can see the difference obviously in the structure probably a little more sand for whatever reason but in a till that's to be normal it's just that everything and anything can be mixed into it right right this is also influenced though by you can see the root runs on the yeah, I see that. There was a really, uh, a really anxious worm here trying to get all the way down to the, the CKJJ. Well, you can't see them now, but there's actually, um, actually worm holes actually on the stuff we're standing on. We saw that when we were digging it. Now I'm poking holes in it with my little tile probe here, but the worms can get that deep, surprisingly enough. So, yeah, even in this stuff. Well, speaking of drainage, maybe you can kind of enlighten, enlighten us here, but um, how would you expect water to move through this profile? Um, through this profile? Yeah. Okay, well, typically it will surface run through with the major uh, major pores and then you really your only way that the water is going to get anywhere through this is primarily to, to be released quickly through the through the larger root runs as well or the, the worm holes either one uh, this is actually a, an imperfectly drained soil because you can see um, uh, the actual models here so the groundwater has come up or was at, up here and, and uh, purging on this this area at one time the, the uh, <coughs> The uh, site now is tile drained, so uh, you don't see as much water coming up as it used to. But, uh, but anyway, the main thing is you're going to get a perching, like a minor perching first after a good rain, and then it will run through those cracks. The more of those cracks you can you can actually get, or those, those flow systems you can yeah. get, so for drainage is better. Worms in this sense are, are adding quite a bit of drainage to our, our imperfectly drained profile. Absolutely. Um, now, if I was to come in here during a, a wetter year, um, say I had a lot more moisture in this profile, and I was seeing, you know, high stresses that we would, you know, maybe be able to measure in this region, um, I would expect to see some consolidation. How do you think that would affect um, uh, soil uh, water movement again? That, well, the that... consolidation is going to actually close up all of those pores, so you won't have as many large pores to drain the water as quickly. Yeah. So uh, any compaction that's that's going to happen will be that'll be the the larger pores will be the one that disappear first. And the the other thing there um, now, if I compact this layer, and this would be a, a, a relatively compactable layer, it's there's uh, under the right wetness conditions, I would expect to be able to make a very good road out of that that soil, mm -hmm. um, or a good driveway at least. Maybe not a, a an actual kings on. Queen, Queen's Ontario Road Highway, but um, if I was to consolidate this layer, now I'm I'm just severely limiting the the water that can get away from this this upper region and the water that can come up from the bottom. Uh, understanding this this field is tile drain, so I'm not going to get a lot of water up through my my profile, but I do want it to get at least into the rooting zone, um, so my crops can get to it. Yeah. The roots, the, the roots will try and get down there, and as you can see, they've in some cases, they're doing succeed, their best. They they're, some down. of them followed that root, that wormhole, all the way down. So, and that was the the case. We found a lot of fibrous roots uh, in the bottom of this soil pit when we dug it last night. So. Yeah, there are a few. Not that one. So that's the. Uh, there are some roots in there. I don't know if you can see that, but there you go. <laughs> that's that's from the that's sea. That's the sea horizon. Yes. Yeah. Some structure, some, but not a lot. Not a lot there. of structure. It's there. Um, oh, very interesting. Um, so yeah, there's there's your soil profile. That uh, that kind of puts the I always I kind of put the sensors in blind when I go to a site, um, and then I usually get to you know open the present afterwards, so I get to see what kind of um, stresses we're seeing under the equipment. And then when I go to dig the sensors out, I really see what kind of profile we were in. That's the, the trouble with doing sort of in situ measurements with undisturbed soil is um, I, I don't know how to reinterpret the results until I kind of can, you know, close the loop on, on what the soil profile looks like. And this, 
this really kind of clarifies uh, what kind of pressures we were seeing over there. All right, welcome. It's Horst Bonner here, and uh, it's a real pleasure to work with Aaron Stevanis today. Aaron, we're going to talk a little bit about soybean fertility. You, of course, are the technical sales manager for Eastern Canada for yeah. the Mosaic Company. And as we travel around, both of us do in Ontario, we see a lot of potassium, potassium deficiency. deficiency. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and of course, it's so, uh, clear and easy to identify if you look at that leaf, that yellowing around the edge of the leaf, and then, and then if it's severe, you can even have that browning of the leaf, right? So I don't know about you, Aaron, but uh, first, you have to ask, what's your soil test level yep. if, you, if you're called out to a field, right? Absolutely, and that's, you know, the first thing, now, say you don't have that available, there are some other things we can do too, right? Right, right. For example, we could dig some roots. Yeah, yeah. See what's going on below the ground. I mean, obviously a soil test will tell you what's going on fertility wise, but right. I mean, we need that root. That root is bringing yes. in all that nutrient, that potassium. So uh, we need to check to make sure that that is, uh, you know, in good sound uh, quality. Well, and, and you're so right. Just because the soil test is in reasonable shape doesn't mean that you won't have these kind of symptoms because the nutrient has to be able to flow in, right? And Absolutely. we can have some real problems in terms of the root that prevents it. So let's dig some some plants and take a look. And we've got some root right here. You betcha. And and when you look at that root, Aaron, are you happy with the fact that um, of the root growth? Are you happy with that? Well, in general, I'm very happy with the root growth. We don't see any restrictions. These roots are nice and uh, and uh, straight, so there's no restrictions from compaction layers. Uh, we see some nice fibrous root systems in here. Um, so in general, this right root's good. But the other thing, what else do we got to look for? Soybean cyst nematode. You That's a it. huge one. So often when I go to a field that has these clear potassium deficiency symptoms, when you dig, man, there's cysts there. So that's another whole conversation, but it needs to be uh, made clear that you should always look for that right, right off the bat. Absolutely. Okay, so potassium's a big one. I think a lot of us have that drilled into our subconscious almost when it comes to soybeans. But now I want to talk a little bit about boron. Yep. Boron, is that part of uh, a new soybean fertility uh, approach? Yeah, absolutely. And and boron is a really cool nutrient. So when we talk about boron in general, it's always been, it's the fertility nutri micronutrient. Remember, it's a micronutrient, yeah. so we don't need it in a lot of, not high excess quantities, right. very small. It can actually be toxic if you put too much on. So we always talked about it with, with fertility. So like helping pollinate corn and soybeans, helping keeping those flowers alive, because we know Okay. We know that uh, so it, the biggest challenge is keeping those flowers alive because that's our, some of our biggest yield right, loss, right? Right, right. Um, but also it has to do with root development too. That's another part that we don't talk about. Um, and the other challenge with boron is getting that even distribution. Mm. Because, because it's a small amount you're putting on. You got it. Right, So right. if you're putting a high, con you could be toxic one area and deficient in one area. Um, you get a little bit of haloing around that smaller uh, amount of granules, say, like if it's yeah. a granular boron, but it's still not distributed for the whole crop to take up. So that's a bit of the challenge on the delivery yeah, of yeah. boron that we've been uh, been facing. But so we do Aaron, we're doing some trials this year, right, um, to assess the difference between straight potash, 0060, versus having some boron in there in the product. So I'm really excited to see how those trials will turn out for us. Like the, the spot we're standing right here, it is potassium versus no potassium and the difference is huge. It's huge. Now visually, would you expect to see uh, a boron deficiency in soybeans or is it one of these things you don't really see easily? I'd say that's a great question. And uh, in general, I mean, sometimes we do see boron deficiency. It's usually more evident in a crop like alfalfa, but in right. soybeans, I'd say it's some yield potential that's maybe sitting on the table that we took away because you don't see any visual deficiency symptoms. Okay, okay. Okay, now let's switch gears a little bit. Um, this spring, super dry, you know, some, some cases six weeks after planting, still no rain. And of course, as we, feed soybeans there's a lot of growers that want to put some 
fertilizer in furrow. So we have to talk about safety. Yep. Seed safety, right? Absolutely. And what and what do you think what do you, what's the number one thing when it comes to fertilizers? What is it that that makes it unsafe? Well, largely we talk about the salt index, yep. right? The salt index and it's just an indicator of of the potential damage it can cause because of the osmotic pressure that it will exert. In other words, it sucks out the moisture from the seed because around the seed you have a lot of salt and you've changed the osmotic yep. os osmotic potential, right? So then my question is to you, right? Grower knows he's low. He wants to, in terms of the soil test, he wants to put some in. What can what can he get away with? Let's well, start with P. Okay. Talk about P205. P205, which is, you know, in general, when we look at starters, phosphates are the number one thing that we want in that furrow or in a two by two band because we it's, it's root development. That's what we right. really focus on right. phosphates. And so in soybeans, when we're delivering, especially with an air cart, um, we're putting it in for furrow with the soybeans. We need to be very careful on exactly like you all you uh, discussed, horse, on that salt index and defining what is a salt. So in general, phosphates, they do have a salt index, but they're much lower than a potassium product. So we can get away with more. The other thing we need to talk about is row width. So I know we did mosaic did a did a trial where we looked at row spacing. Yes. Um, how much uh, P205 we put in with the row spacing. And the wider you go with spacing, the more challenge you had with stand reduction and reduction in yield, because even though the salt index is low, there still is some salt in there. So row width plays a factor. When we were looking, and a part of that is because of distribution, okay. that, that distribution within the row. So when we looked at soybeans with seven and a half inch rows, we could get up to a hundred pounds of product of Micro Essentials SZ, which is 40 pounds of P205. And that was kind of our safe rate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But as anything in agriculture, environment plays everything. It's huge, isn't it? And what type of year did we have this year? Super dry early. Yep. Now it's wet, but anyway, then, yeah. it was, <laughs> then it was dry, right? It's like tap off, tap yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, super dry. And just like you had talked about with what, what salts do to seed is pull that moisture away. Well, if we already have low soil moisture yeah. and we're putting a product that has a salt index in there, we have a higher chance of there being some seed injury. So it is definitely a fine line. When we start to get drier soils, you start dialing that rate back yes, and looking yes. at different options for fertility. And of course, the other one, uh, soil type, sandy yeah, soils are absolutely. much more susceptible. Okay, so you say 100 pounds of MES, which is equal to 40 P205. Now the salt index on MES is about 23, Correct. right? Yep. So I'm fairly comfortable with about 50 pounds of MAP in furrow in 15 inch rows. That's the work that I did. So the, the numbers kind of shake out very similar, right? Yep. And MAP is, uh, has a salt index of about 30. Okay, mm -hmm. so that makes sense. Just to put it in context now, people really want to put some potash yep. in because that's what soybeans need so desperately. Salt index on potash, 116, yep. right? That puts it into perspective. Boy, that, that, it's just very dangerous, right? Yep, I'm gonna do, do I dare do a Johnson and do the alert, alert, full <laughs> stop. Like, you know, that's do not put merit of potash, or any like high potassium based product in furrow with soybeans, leave it to broadcast, it's just bad news. Now, okay, I gotta push you on this because we have growers who want to put in K-Mag yep. because of that magnesium, right? That, yep. that side of it. And K-Mag has a salt index that's only at 43. Correct. Right? Yep. So it's, it's, it's much reduced obviously compared to 116. What's your take on that? And then before you give your take, I got to warn you, I, I'm not a big fan. I know. Okay. All yep. right. So go ahead. No, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. And so it, once again, it kind of it looks at how much phosphate you're putting down. You know, I think that's a factor too, because we're still, you're still adding potential salts, right? Right. So, I mean, it, we need to look at the phosphate and how much K-Mag you're putting down. In general, we still, if we're putting on, say, that 100 pounds of Micro Essentials SZ in, I would say when if we're pushing in K-Mag and it's dry like it was, yeah. that's when I pump. That's when I would be pumping the brakes. 
But if you're, say, reducing your phosphate and you want to put some K-Meg in to get some magnesium, sulfur, and potassium in there, um, you know, you're still playing with a risk. But if you have good soil moisture, you know, maybe 30 pounds. But then, okay. Okay. you know, uh, my question is, is what do you what do you want out of it? Yeah, okay. So I, I think that's where we can wrap this conversation up. My basic um, theory is this, and it's not even a theory, really. We did the work, right? The response to in furrow or even banded in a two by two compared to broadcast is not really much better. In fact, most of the time it's the same. Yeah. So you get to this risk versus benefit question. I think we have good evidence that you should just broadcast your fertilizer for soybeans. And if you want to put some in furrow, I, I can live with, with some P205. On the potassium side, I think you're better off just to, just to not bother. Jeez, and when you said no fertility here, I was going to call you and we we're going to oh. have a good back. But no, I actually agree with you. If we're looking at, because also if we look at, step back to our 4R standpoint, right? if we get our potassium integrate right, 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 right source, right place, right time, right? Yeah. So if we're getting it in the soil, we're not having to worry about incorporating any of that. We can still no-till soybeans. If we're, we're looking at our amount of K2O that we actually want for removal of soybeans, we're never going to get that in a safe rate in a band. Yes, in, absolutely. In, in furrow, yeah, I should say. Yeah, yeah. And so we really need to be looking at that broadcast. And then also, if you are using K-Mag, then you can get to levels that are high enough where you're going to get good distribution of magnesium. Magnesium definitely helps with uh, getting nutrition, actually magnesium and potassium together work really well at getting nutrition into the plant, but also helps make photosynthate move from the leaf to the roots and the leaf to the uh, to the pods and soybeans or any uh, of the, essentially the grains that we're producing. So really helping in that in that movement of the in the phloem of nutrition. Right, right. So magnesium helps, but the amount that we're gonna put in furrow probably isn't gonna be enough. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you on that broadcast yeah. side, put the magnesium out, put the right. phosphate in the, right. so, in the row and drive on. Well, certainly I, I'm convinced, let's leave it this way. If we're going to grow 60, 80, maybe 100 bushel beans, we're gonna have to feed those beans, yeah. right? And, and this plot is another perfect example of the visual differences and stay tuned, we'll get the yields from this and, and we'll see yep. what the difference is in terms of these treatments. So, absolutely. thank you. Thank you. Hey, I'm Christine O'Reilly. I'm the forage and grazing specialist with OMAFRA. It's time for second cut. So I'm back in the field. We're going to test out some modifications to the windrow moisture sampler. If you missed part one, that's in episode two of the 2021 Ontario Diagnostic Days. So go check that out. This is the original windrow moisture sample designed by Ron Thamert. It's two feet of two inch ABS pipe. First of all, we thought that a wide mouth version might work better, make it easier to load and unload. So we've got a wide mouth, which is a three inch, and an ultra wide mouth, which is a four inch. And I'm back in the field with Fritz Troutmansdorf of the Ontario Hay and Forage Co-op. So the first thing we'll do, we'll stuff the three inch one full with hay, and then stick the probe in. Sounds good. Okay, so if you want, I can get started here. Are we racing? Are we trying to see which one's faster? Yep. All right. <laughs> So mine is more or less full. And I'm still except the, mine. except a couple inches on the top, which really doesn't matter. Yeah, so that one was definitely faster to fill because yes. you've got yours totally probed. And yep. I still mm -hmm. was trying to fill this one. All right, how's that one empty? So it's difficult to unload with the plunger but you can pull it out by hand fairly easy. Most of it, and then just the rest with the plunger. So it looks like the wider the pipe, the easier it is to do. Mine is empty. 
I will say though, the downside of this one is it's hard to carry. Like it's so fat. It doesn't fit well, I anything. think one thing we should have is handles on those things. Also, when you operate the plunger and the pipe so that you can hold it with one hand while you're probing and stuff like that, you know? So uh, that might be something to consider, you know? Yeah. Because uh, like when you have it and you want to put the plunger in, it, it's very hard to handle, right? So, yeah, uh, that's, that's definitely something that the two inch is a lot easier to get a good grip on, even though it's harder to use. So maybe the three inch is the happy medium width wise. Yeah. Because it takes a while to fill two feet of length here. So again, this is the two inch diameter like the original, but we've also done a one foot wide mouth, three inch, and a one foot ultra wide mouth at a four inch diameter. So uh, okay. you want this one or sure, this one? Sure, I'll take yeah. the three inch. Yeah. You, can, you can have the super wide mouth. I'll take okay. the three inch. We'll get some fresh air. Well, it doesn't really matter, so. Okay. Mm -hmm. So part of why loading the four inch was easier for me is that I have narrow hands. I can actually stick it inside the pipe. How are you making it, Fritz? Pretty good. <laughs> My pranks won't fit in there, but that's okay. <laughs> But uh, the wider opening definitely uh, makes it easier to load. There's no question about it. So how many measurements do we really think we need? Like I know the original design that Ron Thamert did out of the University of Idaho was to try to get four measurements out of this yes. long tube. I agree with four measurements, but you're easier off using this two times. Mm -hmm. You can also take different samples from different spots. You know. And you have to anyway, right? Yeah, it's variable yeah. all through the field, so we want to take measurements from different spots. Yeah. So, so I guess your favorite's the four inch. Four inch short. <laughs> My favorite's the three inch short because okay. it's a little easier to hold on to. Yeah. So either one of them will work fine. Yeah. 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 And I mean that was our conclusion with the original is that it mm -hmm. works. Yeah. Yeah. We were just trying yeah. to see if if any of these modifications would make it better, and I think I think they did. They're a little easier to handle yeah. you know, and uh, to fill and empty because you need to empty them too. And if you have a very narrow two inch oh. tube, it's sometimes very hard to get them out of there too. Absolutely. You know? They saw the post pounder efforts to try to get that yeah, empty. Yeah, post pounder so. makes it work. You almost need a hook or something. Right? Yeah. And, um, but those ones you can reach in by hand and pull them out mm -hmm. if you have some in there. You know? That explains why you like the four inch. <laughs> That's <laughs> like right. <three> <laughs> The other modification that we wanted to test out is, this is the original plunger. So it's three feet of inch and a quarter PVC pipe, and it fits very snugly into that original two inch model. The challenge is when we're loading this, if there's stems sticking out of the end, sometimes we can't get that plunger to go. So one thing we wanna to try today is if we have extra space around the plunger, if it's not as snug of a fit. So if there's room, if there's wiggle room in there, does that make it easier to load these as well? Oh. So in conclusion, uh, the desirable rate is get four ratings, uh, four readings from different spots. Uh, to get the uh, conclusive average. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the short tubes, you can practically get two readings per fill. So the recommendation would be if you use the short two inch, uh, three inch or short four inch tubes, fill them up twice and get two readings out of each fill up. And that will give you a pretty good uh, indication where you are in terms of moisture. Mm -hmm. I see it as, uh, okay, you're here, it's noon, we know it's gonna rain tomorrow. So where are we? What can we do in practical terms with that hay today? So we have a chance to harvest it. So we know we're in the high 30s. So we need to get another 10, 15% out of that hay in terms of moisture. Mm -hmm. So knowing where we are, looking at the forecast for this afternoon, um, and knowing the exact moisture, I can, uh, um, make the management decision, okay, in half an hour, I have a tether back here. 
who will fluff it up one more time and then uh, we'll come back at four or five in the afternoon and just rake it up in front of the baler with the intention to get it down to about 25, 28 percent and make it harvestable and, uh, and hold it with the acid. Hold it with acid and put it through the dryer, you know. So, so if, if I don't have exact moisture measurement, I cannot make those decisions right what exactly I should do with that hay today, you know. And the short window I have to work with, you know. So how how many spots in the field would you take samples from to make that decision? Or I would go to take? three or four spots and four spots. knowing my field, okay, I have a shady area or an area that's facing north and doesn't get much sun, I probably get a different reading there. Mm -hmm. So if it's much uh, higher in moisture than the rest of it, I might leave it or treat it different, you know? Yeah. So you have to judge it by what you what your field is doing, you know? And um, if the crop is uniform, if the field is uniform, like it's always easy on a flat square piece, you know, and where everything is the same, but if we, you have- We don't all have flat square pieces. Though. No, that's right. So if you know you have areas that might be questionable, you go there and take some samples there and make sure uh, you compare them to the other ones and that will, uh, guide your management decisions what you do with that crop. Good afternoon, I'm uh, Dan Surrett. And I'm Jim Warren. We're both land resource specialists at the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture here in Guelph and today we're at the Arkell Research Station. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit to you today about our topsoil program and uh, give you a little bit of teaser for our ag conference in January. Okay Dan, well so how do we really get into this? Well, uh, actually the project was first meant to be like a, a project to quantify soil carbon across topsoil in agricultural soils of Ontario. The Soil Health and Conservation Strategy 2017, if you recall, had some targets by texture class for soil organic matter content. And really what we don't have is a baseline to understand where we're at with soil carbon and how the BMPs that the ag community is implementing is affecting those soil carbon levels. So yeah, so we quickly realized that um Soil health tests were quite a hot topic, particularly in Ontario. For example, uh, it was the uh, Cornell health test that, uh, that came out. And we started to realize that we could actually leverage some of this information uh, to help with developing BMPs for various farmers across the province. And yeah, so we went even a step farther than that. And we reached out to the soils at Guelph faculty at the University of Guelph. And, uh, and we're working with them to test different soil health tests that are included in things like the Cornell soil health test and the Haney uh, soil health test to try and see how those tests are applicable in Ontario conditions. And so we're working with, uh, you know, Carrie Dunfield looking at soil microbiology, uh, Paul Veroni and Adam Gillespie to look at soil carbon, soil organic matter dynamics, uh, Asim Bizwa looking at predictive modeling and digital soil mapping, um, Richard Heck to look at aggregate stability. And so there's a lot of really great information that's being leveraged from the samples that we're collecting out in the field. So Jim, one of the questions I get quite often when we're out in the field from the different producers is, you know, uh, how did the program roll out and how did we choose all of the sites we're sampling for this program? Well, the program actually started in 2019. We uh, used a computer algorithm to choose uh, 1,500 sites across the province representative of all different types of soils in agricultural production, all different types of, uh, of management processes. And we started by making cold calls and going to various farms and asking them just, hey, can we come into your place and, and uh, sample, your, uh, sample your soil? And uh, we actually have to thank, thank producers because we were, uh, they were, most producers were very, very receptive. So that was, that was a great thing. Yeah, and so if we were to look at progress to date, we've got about 850 samples of the mm -hmm. 1,500 done. It's been a slow couple of summers, but we hope to be picking things up again this fall and in 2022, when we hope to wrap it up by winter. The first thing that we're interested in sampling soils is soil physical properties, right, Jim? And yep. so uh, the one that you think of right off the bat is soil bulk density. So that really has to do with soil compaction, which we know can be a problem. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with soil aggregates and sand, silt, and clay content. So the soil texture, right? Yep, exactly. We also do things like, well, carbon, obviously, because that's 
the, orig the origin of the, the, the work, obviously. There was carbon, which relates to soil organic matter, obviously, uh, and plant nutrients and various other things related to, your, to organic matter, cation exchange capacity, for example. Perfect, and then the last thing we're interested in is the soil microbiology. So we put on our fancy anti-DNA gloves uh -huh. and we can sample and we can send this off for DNA sequencing of soil bacteria and soil fungi. Because the last thing we want to do is collect 1500 <laughs> soils across Ontario, have them all come back as Dan and Jim. So as a preview of things to come, Jim, uh, come January when we actually have the uh, Ontario Ag Conference, uh, we're just going to go over maybe a few of the kind of key results as a, as a kind of a pre-release of things that we're going to talk about in much more detail at the conference in January. So the first thing that sort of fell out of the study was uh, the relationship between soil organic matter and soil texture. And we were finding that uh, the clay and sandy soils, for example, had there were pretty good levels in the, uh, in the of soil organic matter in those soils. But um, when we went to the, uh, the sandy loams, the loams and the clay, clay loams, we were finding that the average uh, organic matter content for those textured soils was actually little below what we expected for or we had targeted for the um, for our uh, soil organic matter requirements for the province. Perfect so the second thing that we were uh, interested in looking at was you know soil organic matter as it relates to cropping systems so we can see here in this slide um, that uh, the last two groups the uh, annual crops with the forage included in the rotation and the forage and pasture sites are different. They have more soil carbon than the first three groups, which were, you know, single crop systems or two crop systems or three annual cropping systems. And so there's really something to be said about the impact of forages on soil organic matter. Certainly something that we'll have to kind of look at in a little bit more detail come January. Do you have a, another tidbit you might share yep. with them, Jim? Yeah, there's a little bit of great news. The uh, we did some work on cover crops and there's been a great increase and in uptake by, by producers to actually, um, to actually use cover crops from our first data that we had collected in 2001 till 2016. So uh, it, it's great to see that <clears throat> and we're also seeing that uh, the um, percent of farms that are using that have, have, have increased quite substantially. Thanks for joining us this afternoon at the Arkell Research Station uh, at the Ontario Diagnostic Days. Looking forward to seeing you all in January at our session on the Topsoil Sampling Program. And uh, make sure you come because we're going to have some guest stars yep. from the University of Guelph come talk to us about some of their very specialized analyses as part of this program. Thank you. There you have it. We hope you've enjoyed episode number five of Ontario Diagnostic Days. Look for us on September 28th for our next episode. We'll see you then. The Ontario Diagnostic Days on realagriculture.com is brought to you by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, the University of Guelph, Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, Grain Farmers of Ontario, Agris Co-op, BSF Canada, Bear and Decal. Corteva and Pioneer, Great Lakes Grain, Mazex, The Mosaic Company, Pride Seeds, and Syngenta.